How's it going everyone? Welcome back to Boy Lie Hobby Time. Today I'm recreating a moment from Iron Man 2. This actually happens to be my first Marvel diorama, also my first F1 diorama, and also my first Mickey Rourke diorama. I decided if I was going to open up my channel to Marvel F1 and Mickey Rourke, I might as well start with what is arguably the most iconic moment involving all three. After opening up and unboxing this Ferrari, I removed it from its sprues and began assembly using plastic cement. I knew I was going to be running this bad boy through my bandsaw, so I made sure that all the pieces were securely fit together so that nothing would rattle apart while it was being cut. This isn't a snap fit kit and does require glue to be put together, but I went a little overboard to give it more stability. Ironically, I have actually only ever seen Iron Man 2 one time right after it first came out. But the moment that Whiplash walks into oncoming F1 traffic and uses his proto lasso of truth on an unlucky Ferrari driver definitely stuck with me. I revisited the scene since then to collect some screenshots of that moment in preparation for this build to make sure that everything was screen accurate. In spite of those reference photos, however, almost nothing in this diorama turned out screen accurate. For instance, my keen-eyed viewers may have already noticed that this model from Tamiya is completely incorrect. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any plastic models of the vehicles from the movie, so I had to make do with what I could find. Apparently, the cars from the movie aren't even screen accurate themselves. The cars shown on screen are modeled loosely after old F1 cars, not cars that were current at the time of the release of the movie. At least that's what I read online, I don't know anything about F1 cars, so don't quote me on that. I'm not sure if water decals have a shelf life or not, but these gave me more trouble than normal. I stuck with the small decals after the larger ones kept falling apart on me. After the car, the next thing to figure out was the base, which comprises of part of the raceway and a section of safety barrier and chain link fence. I cut up some cork board to the size of the gesso board that I was using with a nice sharp X-Acto knife, and then I glued that in place, working from one end of the base to the other. I probably should have used an even coat of wood glue or PVA glue for this, as the little beads of super glue left some loose spots which I had to go back and fix later. For the components of the metal safety barrier, I used this piece of corrugated styrene. I cut strips of the styrene to make what I saw in my reference photo, and each section of the barrier was made from three horizontal sheets of metal connected with shorter pieces of the same corrugated metal between. I sliced all of those sheets accordingly. After all of the vertical posts were on, I connected the pieces together with those small horizontal pieces, and then I brushed on some solvent cement to make sure the styrene was securely welded together. Dioramas often look more interesting when things are placed at an angle, so that's what I did here. And upon thinking about it, I probably should have angled the track the other direction to give myself more room to place Mickey, but even so, it's better than 90 degrees. I drilled some holes, which I filled with styrene rods, to anchor the wall at every vertical post. I carefully installed that and glued it into position permanently. Next, I grabbed some small chain link fence sections from Woodland Scenics, which I'm going to combine to make a larger fence section. To anchor those in place, I cut up some additional square styrene tubes and then some strips of square rods to hide the gaps between the individual fence sections. I used a combination of plastic cement and super glue to ensure that everything was bonding properly. I made some additional fence sections of my own to place at an angle, and then I finally finished the fence with some nice sturdy supports. With the safety barrier and fence done, it was time to figure out the figures. I looked online for a figure of Mickey Rourke in the same scale as my F1 car. I was hoping I could pose and customize the figure, but my search results did not yield anything usable. Uh, but I did find this. I then refined my search to whiplash figures in 1 to 20th scale, and even still, nothing I found was quite going to work. So instead, I used Hero Forge to get a generic figure in the right pose with similar features that I could paint up and customize to look like whiplash. I made the driver of the car on Hero Forge as well. I removed the steering wheel from the car I cut it up and glued it into the hands of the driver, and then I took the characters outside to prime. I painted them with a black primer, but before I paint them, I'm going to finish the surface of the track. To add some texture to the base, I was going to stipple on some Tamiya putty, get a nice asphalt texture, but after a little bit of dabbing, I decided to switch to my friend Scratch Bashing Spackling Paste, which was a far better choice for this surface. After the spackle had dried, I sanded it lightly, and I took it outside where I gave it a priming coat of gray and uneven white to create a nice concrete base coat. 
The last thing to do before painting was to run this car through the bandsaw, so I carried that over to my table, I set the guide to my desired height, and I carefully sliced this bad boy in two. With that cut, it was time to put away the bandsaw and get on to the painting. Off camera, I did drill a hole and add a little rod to keep the car suspended at the right angle. I masked off the white lines on the road using some masking tape, and then I used my airbrush to paint those white, along with a few sections of the fence. I then peeled off the masking tape and began applying washes of various colors, including rust and diesel stains from Vallejo. I dabbed and spread those colors all around with a paper towel till the whole surface had been evenly weathered. Unfortunately, I hadn't considered sealing the lines before doing this, so all the lines came off. After weathering the fence too heavily with an oil wash and wiping that down, I reapplied the white lines from earlier and I was pretty happy with the result, although the fence looks a little dirtier than a fence in Monte Carlo should. With the base complete, it was time to paint the figures, and while I do that, I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons. One thing I did, that I don't know why I did, was to make Whiplash barefoot. Definitely not screen accurate. But as I made this diorama, I came to realize that nothing really was, which is why it works. It's kind of like that old game set. If you haven't played it, you should. It's a great game. As long as everything is different, it's a set. Consider the driver, for instance. Some of the colors are accurate, but none of the patterns on the suit are accurate. And if you zoom in, the little logo that I painted on his head definitely does not look like a little horse. With all the painting done, it was time to clean up my workstation and get ready for the electronics. Before gluing anything in place, I added a battery housing to the underside of the gesso board, and then we moved over to our boy Whip to get those lashes installed. I wrapped a blue flexible filament around his torso, and because I didn't want it to glow as intensely as the Whip's, I connected it to a small resistor. I used heat shrink to keep the filament in position. Uh, the filament doesn't take glue, but the heat shrink does, which is a new trick for positioning these lamps. Luckily, Whiplash's wires are all visible, so I just wrapped the wires around the figure to get power to the whips as well as create his outfit. Once both arms had been wrapped and connected, I soldered everything up that needed to be, and I prepped the base for the install. I drilled holes wherever wires would be passing through the base, and because one end of each whip is resting on the ground, it made connecting those ends extremely convenient. I did go back and wrap some wires around the filaments for aesthetic reasons to look more like what is pictured in the movie, uh, using more of that heat shrink to hold the filaments and the wires together. Once that was done, I glued him into position and I got all the wires soldered. I connected the circuit to a magnetic reed switch, which is under the base behind the fence, and I put the magnet that activates the switch in a little barrel off camera. I was considering ways to light up the cut lines, but because the pieces of the car are still so close together in the moment being pictured, I figured it was better to just paint them instead. They are close enough to the light source that the molten paint job looks convincing enough. I added little bits of coarse steel wool and tiny fiber optic strands to create the look of the sparks. I'm all about practical effects. And speaking of which, I was surprised to find out that the car in this scene was actually computer generated, and that they didn't actually split a $12 million car in two. I guess car enthusiasts can be grateful that the movie wasn't directed by Christopher Nolan. After painting the sides of the diorama with black 4.0, I called it good. That is it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Huge shout out as always to my patrons. You guys are the best. Have an awesome week, everyone. I'll see you next time.